everybody. Um, please, if you wouldn't mind giving another round of applause for Nishama and Harry for coming out um, and telling you their stories tonight. That was so nice of them to come. And thank you, to Michelle, too, for allowing me to bring some friends. Um, so this is supposed to be about storytelling. I thought I would start out with Once Upon a Time. Once upon a time, there was a little girl who was growing up in a small town in a place very different from where we are today. And we call that place Alabama. Um, and her parents had met in college and pretty quickly got married, had two kids, pretty quickly got divorced, the dad got remarried, and he moved away. And uh, this meant that uh, the daughter, the little girl, only got to see him twice a year for a few days at Christmas and for a couple of weeks in the summer. And he decided to communicate with her using audio. Merry Christmas, Margaret McGinn Jones, Big Bird. This is your dad, and I wanted to wish you a Merry Christmas with your new tape recorder. And anyway, I hope you have a good Christmas, and I hope you enjoy your tape recorder. And I'm going to put some music on here that I know you like, and maybe I won't get them all, but we'll get some of them anyway. So that little girl was me, and that is a cassette from 1976 um, that I still have. So uh, my dad is and was a musician. He was a cellist, he was a pianist, he sang in the choir, he was a DJ when he was in college. And one of the main ways that he communicated with me and my sister, uh, we each got a tape recorder, mine was white, hers was red, um, and he would make cassette tapes and send them to us. And he would talk into it, and he would tell jokes, and he would play music. And when we would go visit him, he would interview us, uh, sometimes one at a time, and sometimes both of us. He'd be like, so is this your favorite bathing suit? Yeah! You know, that kind of thing. And then a few weeks later, a cassette would show up in the mail, and it would have his voice, and it would have music, and it would have my voice. And I think that's where my love of audio really started um, because that, those sounds were just for me. Um, that was as close as I could get to being with him and to having um, a lot of my emotional needs met through hearing his voice and hearing music and hearing us interact together. So, flash forward many, many years, I move out here. Uh, I am just starting to uh, work seriously uh, in the audio space, and I'm talking to people about storytelling, and I'm just starting to use the word storyteller to describe myself, right? I'm like, yeah, and now you see all kinds of stuff, like I'm a chief marketing officer and storyteller, and I'm a musician and a storyteller, and I make donuts, and I'm a storyteller, and <laughs> that kind of thing. And so uh, I found this video about that time, and I love playing it for people, and I thought it would be especially uh, uh, pertinent and enjoyable to this crowd. Uh, okay. Mm. Hi, my name is Stefan Sagmeister. I am a Austrian graphic designer who lives and works in New York City. Well, I'm actually quite um, critical of the storytelling theme. I think that the, all the storytellers are not storytellers. Like recently, I read an interview with somebody who designs roller coasters, and he referred to himself as a storyteller. No, Kat, you are not a storyteller. You're a roller coaster designer, and that's fantastic. And more power to you. But why would you want to be a storyteller if you design roller coasters, or if you are storytelling? Then the story that you tell is. It's like this little itsy bitsy little thing. Yes, you go through the space, and yes, you see other spaceships, and yes, that's your story. That's its story. That's boring. People who actually tell stories, meaning people who write novels and make feature films, don't see themselves as storytellers. It's all the people who are not storytellers, who kind of, for strange reasons, because it's in the air, suddenly now want to be storytellers. It sort of took on the mantle of. You know, now everybody's a storyteller. 
Uh, yeah, yeah, you could do that. It's really good. I especially love seeing uh, this kind of cleaned up clip when I'm talking to people on a corporate level, trying to talk to them about storytelling, which they also feel could be a little bit bullshitty. You know, like I work in R&D and chemistry. I don't need to be a storyteller kind of thing. So, um, and I also like this because he talks about, you know, like people who make films, and I don't know about you, but I went to go see his film, Happy, at Yerba Buena, right? So it's like, there he was dissing it, and then he did it. So um, the long and short of it is, I both agree and disagree with uh, the concept, I guess, of storyteller, and maybe how he's using it in this context. So one of my many jobs is co-producer of the Bay Area Moth Story Slams. And in those, yes, and thank you, there's some people here tonight, right, who come. Somebody came up to me and like, loved on the pack, the fanny pack. If you've been to the Moth Story Slam, you know all about this fanny pack. If not, I'll tell you afterwards. Um, but anyway, uh, I, I do those, and those are uh, five minute, um, uh, personal, uh, true stories told by anybody. It's open mic. And the power that I have witnessed in the almost two years of producing these is unlike anything I've seen. Um, we do have people who are more practiced, but we have people who get on stage for the first time. And it creates a space, and it's, uh, I bring this up because it is to me still audio, it's spoken word storytelling, there are no graphics in the back, and the connection is made in a face-to-face -face way with the storyteller and the audience. That's what's creating the space. And I think that's very potent. Storytelling, and the capital S word, um, is what I think our friend Stefan was talking about. And um, that is on a very different level. That has to do with formatting um, and uh, crafting the arc. In any case, I think that gifted storytellers um, do a very valuable thing for us. They are interpreters. Um, and I think, I, I thought a lot about this before coming and doing this talk, I changed this a couple of times, especially with what we've witnessed in the past 12 months. You know, we've been told we live in a post-fact world, <laughs> um, a lot of different things. You can clearly see that the power of narrative is more effective than data. Simply repeating facts over and over again is not persuasion. It may be education, but it is not persuasion. If I made all my decisions based on data, I would never buy another pair of jeans again. I have nine pairs of jeans, like it would be ridiculous. Like, what do you need another pair of jeans? But do I go out and buy one? Yes. Do I know donuts are bad for me? Yes. Do I eat them? Yes. Right? Uh, Facts are not compelling, uh, and, and life sometimes is not compelling until somebody gives you the whys and the wherefores, and I think this is a great quote that really exemplifies that from, from Maria. So I think in talking about storytelling that way, especially for the people in this room, the people who are designers, the people who are technologists, you are creating and envisioning futures. You have a responsibility when you use stories, when you come up with personas, when you come up with user stories, when you're trying to get buy-in for your idea. Um, you have a responsibility that comes with that um, to use storytelling uh, for good, so to speak. Um, so what are some good elements of um, audio storytelling. Um, well, obviously, it's the audio, right? Um, all good storytelling will appeal to your senses. You know, you'll be able to see the city of Paris. You'll be able to hear the voice um, of the baby whale. You'll be able to uh, experience the emotions in the story. But in uh, radio and radio drama and podcasting and narrated formats, 
Uh, it really does hinge on the intimacy that is created when someone is speaking right into your ear. Um, and when I was getting ready to record the narration for a public radio documentary that I did, I worked with a wonderful mentor, Dee Mae Roberts. Uh, she is a public radio documentary maker, award-winning. She lives in Portland. Um, and we would have these sessions via FaceTime where I would bring her up on my computer and I would have my narration and I would read it and kind of pause and look, you know, at her. And she would uh, say, softer, more conspiratorial, <laughs> like you're telling a friend a secret. And so I would do it again and again and again, until finally I, would I was able to take what I was reading and make it more sound like everyday conversation, like, you know, that I was just talking. Um, and I think this is part of why we're so attracted. We're seeing a bloom and a resurgence in podcasts because um, also going back to the tapes from my dad, usually when you're listening to radio or podcast, it's a one-to-one -one activity. You're not listening to it with a group. I mean, does anybody sit around with a earbud splitter and be like, let's listen to S-Town, you know? Um, you don't. So you've got someone speaking directly into your ear and then into your brain and into your heart. And here's an example of someone uh, that I think a lot of you know who does this really, really well. This is 99% Invisible. I'm Roman Mars. When you send a letter to the president, it first passes through the Office of Presidential Correspondence. The office was started under President McKinley in 1897, who had been receiving about 100 letters per day. By the time Herbert Hoover was president, that number had gone up to about 800 letters per day. Today, the president of the United States gets tens of thousands of letters, parcels, and emails every day. That president, as we produce this story, is still Barack Obama. Dear Mr. President. Dear Mr. President. Dear Mr. President. We met once. You came to my hometown of Tuscaloosa, Alabama. I'm writing Alabama. you today in regards to our relationship with Canada. And if you're one of those letter writers, you must imagine that the odds of the president actually reading your letter are pretty slim. That's Jacob Brogan, a writer for Slate.com and host of Working, a Slate podcast. And you'd be right. Those chances are pretty slim. People often begin with a reflection on, I know no one will read this. I mean, that is a really common open. But someone does read your letter or email. So uh, how many of you actually heard that when it came out back in November? Oh, that's great. So, um, you know, Roman is a master, right? Like somebody's told, more than one person has been like, I would just listen to Roman read me the phone book. Um, <laughs> so uh, I have that as an example. And also it's kind of gratuitous because I'm one of the voices in the front for the letters of the president. Um, but it's clear, you know, the magic uh, that a very well-recorded, uh, very close-miked piece of tape can provide in terms of holding and creating a space for narrative. Um, the second ingredient in creating uh, good narrative, good storytelling, uh, regardless of the medium, is going to be format. And I'm going to go kind of uh, semi-quickly uh, through this part because, look, you can Google it. You can find a ton of different ways that people can structure it. Tim's already talked about, you know, three acts. You know, we tell people when they come to the moth, your story needs to have a beginning and a middle and an end. Um, but I'm going to include a couple of examples um, that I like to refer to and use that I found. Um, this one is one of my favorites because it clearly shows that there are differences in the way that people think about story. Ian Forrester was a novelist. He died in 1970. In his mind, a sequence of events is a story. The king died, then the queen died, is a story. The king died, and then the queen died of grief, is a plot. And to me, that shows how two words can completely change your involvement and the stakes and your understanding. The king must have been pretty damn awesome, right? 
And the queen, how tragic, you're already feeling things in, with two words. So it's really key to pay attention to the details in terms of how they can shift uh, the point that you're trying, the narrative arc that you're trying to get across. Um, the second is an acronym called CROW. This actually comes out of uh, the improv world. Corey Rosen, who is one of our moth hosts, also teaches and is a storyteller, and he brought this up in one of his classes. I find it really useful. Crow, easy to remember. C, character. R, relationship. That could be the characters to each other or to the action. Um, I often think of about it as their relationship also to the listener or the audience. O is objective. Um, a lot of times this is stated as goal, like what is going to happen, what needs to get done, or what is going to change. Um, w, that's where, where something is happening. Uh, this is why often in reports and things, you'll hear someone will mic the crunching of people walking through the leaves and the of the door and all that kind of stuff, because that really helps situate uh, and ground the story and the more authentic it can be, the more resonant it can be, even if it is a place that doesn't exist, right? Um, and then a lot of people don't use E, but I like to. Um, e is for emotion. Um, just like I demonstrated in the previous slide, that can make a lot of difference. Um, I also tend to think about emotion when I'm interviewing people for, um, audio, I always tell them, uh, you know, the, the audience wants to hear a change in your voice. They want you to get softer or for you to get really excited or angry because then you are taking them along in your emotions. Um, one of the best things I ever heard was in a multi-part Miles Davis documentary. This was back when the NEA was giving like big grants to do big documentaries that would play on public radio everywhere. And the documentary maker, uh, I learned a, gr a whole lot from him. His name is Steve Rowland. He lives in Seattle. And in one place, Miles Davis's ex-wife, I believe, is talking about him and the kind of intense relationship they had and one of the things you learn in audio is you mic real close and you take all the sound out so you can put it back in later. But uh, as she talked and, and was getting more upset, she kept playing with her bracelets. And the bracelets would clink together. And as you know, the story got more intense, the clinking kind of got more intense. And a different interviewer might have said, stopped it and said, hey, you know, quit playing with your bracelets. We're gonna put some music under this afterwards but he let it go. And it was such a beautiful detail um, that underscored the emotion in her voice. So I think that's really key. Um, so, you know, we learn a lot of different ways to uh, make a story, right? To make an arc. And um, I'm gonna play this example. The Slack, Slack Variety Pack uh, podcast doesn't exist anymore. I think they have a new podcast. Um, that's taken its place, which name, I'm sorry, I can't remember if you work for Slack, but um, uh, this came out about three years ago, and um, it's one of my favorite things. It's talking about format of a podcast, how to make a podcast. Welcome to the part of this podcast where we teach you how to make your podcast sound like all the other really popular podcasts. The first thing you want to focus on is how you sound. You don't want to sound like a reporter. You want to sound like a regular person. So use the word like, like, like a lot. <laughs> and you want to take pauses, pauses that feel like they may go on too long. Right about now, you're going to want to change the music. This is a different piece of music. It's not intrusive, it's atmospheric. You might even say it's generic. It's an audio signal that 
tells your audience to get ready because you're about to tell them something pretty important and pretty emotional. I'm the first interview subject. I am wandering around on a sidewalk and I'm poorly mic'd. That is how you introduce people in your story. And it's important to remember that you only ever want to use their first name. That was Fred. You're going to want to record me for about three hours, but this 15 seconds is going to be the only usable piece of tape to support the story you want to tell. To legitimize your story, you have to call an expert. Hi, I'm the expert, and I'm about to say a bunch of things that are going to go over your head, but it will make me sound very smart, and you have to trust me. At this point, let your audience just sit in their emotions. And when that's done, it's time to check in with your sponsors. Music like this tells the audience that you're no longer a journalist. You're now a paid spokesperson. Hey, I'm the sponsor. I'm like a 23-year-old kid who's the founder of some company that, you know, delivers baskets full of websites to your front door. (laughs) Twitter, e-commerce, bullshit. Now that you've told your story, it's time to wrap up your podcast. And the best way of doing that is with the credits. You want to make sure that the credits are read by random people who helped make the show. Like me. Hi, I'm a person and I help make this podcast. I'm another person and I also help make this podcast. Hello, this is Fred. I was featured earlier in the podcast. Now I am in the credits. And I feel like that's how you make a podcast. So now yeah, everybody feels like they've totally listened to every podcast that is currently on your phone. Um, so uh, I do this to kind of make a point similar to what Tim had said earlier, that um, with the bloom of podcast or the renaissance of podcast, whatever you want to call it, um, you know, a format has uh, arisen, I guess. And sometimes that can obscure mediocre content. Um, Sometimes that can elevate uh, mediocre content or good content. And I think we're all waiting to see what happens um, now that S-Town and Serial and uh, very different types and methods of distribution are happening and, and what's going to arise next. Um, One critical thing that I want to say about uh, how things like S-Town and Serial and wonderful um, stories from This American Life get made, like what is the one critical thing that they've got going for them that like me, like, or you, or Joe Blow doesn't have? And that's this. No. They say no a lot to everything you can ever imagine. Um, It's the editing process, it's brutal. Um, Snap Judgment, The Moth, This American Life, they go through a bajillion million pitches. They say no to the bad ones, they say no to the ones that are sort of good, they say uh, no to the ones they thought were good yesterday but they slept on it, they woke up, they realized it was not good. Uh, they say no to the piece of music that they thought might do, but you know didn't work. They say no to the cheesy sound effects. They say no to the thing that goes too long. No, 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 no. Um, it's key, and and so they have to keep feeding the machine. I think I read somewhere where Brian Reed originally thought that S Town was going to be ten episodes, and they got it down to what, what it ended up being seven. Right? They had mountains of tape. That means a lot of conscious, deliberate decisions. I'm gonna play a clip now. I was really lucky to be able to work on David Sedaris's latest audiobook. Um, it's called Theft by Finding, and it is actually not stories, but a collection and a selection of his diary entries. This is the first volume. I think it's 1977 through 2002. Uh, There will be a volume two coming out later. Um, But in this clip, it's from the um, preface, and he's talking about editing himself, himself. 
Every so often I'll record something that might entertain or enlighten someone, and those are the bits I set aside. I thought I'd eventually put them into a book of diary entries, but when the printout reached a height of eight inches, I decided that maybe two volumes, the second of which will cover the years 2003 to 2017, would make more sense. It's worth mentioning that this is my edit. Of the roughly eight million words handwritten or typed into my diary since September 5th, 1977, I'm including only a small fraction. An entirely different book from the same source material could make me appear nothing but evil, selfish, generous, or even, dare I say, sensitive. On any given day, I am all these things and more. Stupid, cheerful, misanthropic, cruel, narrow-minded, open, petty. The list goes on and on. A different edit, no doubt a more precise one, would have involved handing my diary over to someone else, but that is something I cannot imagine doing unless, perhaps, that person is a journalist. They never get beyond the third page, which they usually call the middle, as in, I'd hope to finish this before our interview, but I'm only in the middle. That said, I don't really expect anyone to listen to this from start to finish. It seems more like the sort of thing you might dip in and out of, like someone else's yearbook or a collection of jokes. It wasn't easy revisiting what are now 156 volumes of my diary. I broke the job up a month or two per day, but after reading about me, I'd have to spend the rest of the day being me. I don't know that I've ever done anything quite so exhausting. He would be in the next room and hear me shout things like, Will you just shut up? And who cares about the goddamn pocket square? Who are you talking to? He'd ask. Me in 2001, I'd answer. <laughs> I can't even imagine going through that many years of diary entries, but um, he heroically did it and then um, recorded it and actually recorded it in San Francisco. It was pretty great. So um, that's it. So there's format, there is voice, there is emotion, and it, there is the power of edit and no. And um, the only thing I would add on to that um, in terms of what I'm trying to do um, moving forward in the audio world is consciously vary the diet. Um, to find people who are trying new formats to find new voices and perspectives. Um, because our stories, whether they're just like you and me talking, like, how was your day? Yeah, this happened to me seven years ago and it was kind of funny, or, you know, da 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 da. Uh, those are connective. Um, other stories are potent. Um, and I kind of think about them uh, when you have emotion in a story that resonates with someone, the only way to get someone to do something is to make them feel something. So when you do craft great stories, you gotta be careful where you point that thing because it's loaded. You know what I'm saying? Um, so I'm gonna take us out with a clip from The Stoop. This is a podcast that I've been working on now for the past several months. It just launched a month ago. The first episode was on Code Switch, if any of you listen to NPR's Code Switch. And uh, this clip is from uh, near the end of the episode that they actually dropped on Wednesday. With everything that's been happening, they kind of interrupted their regularly scheduled program to put together a special episode called Pause. And I was just imagining kind of this like beautiful desert oasis where like the stars are just immense and um, you know, I imagine two friends sitting on top of a mountain in the middle of the night looking up at the stars and one asking the other, like, can you hold the stars in the night for me or can you count the stars in the night for me? And the friend's answer is like, Lolo Kacha, like, there's too many stars, there's too many stars, there's too many stars. And I think about that, like, in terms of identity, trying to understand where we come from. There's so many elements that make us who we are culturally, that make us human. Um, and at a certain point, you kind of have to surrender and release. Like, this isn't for you to grasp, actually. Like, this is beyond your understanding, and that's okay. And 
And that's it. My name is Megan, rhymes with vegan. I'll be around, please uh, come talk to me if you want to know anything about The Moth. That is themoth.org. We have shows every month in San Francisco and Berkeley. Uh, my company's called Indie Thinking. Nishama and Harry have very kindly stuck around too. So if you want to ask veteran storytellers any questions, they're here. Thank you so much.